there is two things. One is there is uh, there is so much. What the internet does is to uh, a long way to answer it. Something like this: the Times has a has a section on its front page that says, uh, you know, it's the website. It's the it's it's what's in the in the print newspaper. It's laid out like the print newspaper, right, with sections and everything. But if you look on the this is my right hand on the right side, you'll notice that there's a column that says most emailed and most read. If your story, like the story of this Iranian blogger that's get, that gets arrested, doesn't make it onto the most read or most emailed, maybe during that period when there was you know, the, the green, was it called the green revolution in Iran, during that period those stories are under the most read or most emailed, but increasingly that's where people go to read. And if you're getting it through your phone, which is which is the which I didn't mention in my opening and, and comments at the beginning, increasingly the way we're going to read news, and again, I want, it doesn't want to overstate it, is through mobile technology on the run. Most of us are doing it already, but we're not recognizing it that way. You get you have a subscription to the newspaper, it lands in front of your door, but you don't have time, so you're reading you know off your phone. So. If you go look at the way that the New York Times or whatever newspaper is, is the, the way the, 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 the mobile application of the Times or whatever is laid out, it is again laid out with latest trending. If the Iranian blogger story is not trending, nobody's going to know about it outside of a very small group of people who may care about uh, you know, internet censorship, who care about autocratic regimes, who care about freedom in indices. Um, who work for Human Rights Watch, who send it to their listserv, or people who are RSSing them. This is sort of a reader that you, you know, how you read the web every day. So if it's, if it's not happening like that, it's becoming increasingly difficult because of this, um, um, the way that new media is structured. It's structured around hits. Um, so it is about getting attention and stories that, are, that may not be really of any worth to us gets the most hits. One last point, Huffington Post, which is an aggregator of news, always gets, a, you know, people always get accused of saying, it's a great site, but if you go there and you see what gets the most hits on Huffington Post, it's usually about Michelle Obama's, what she's wearing for the week, or Lindsay Lohan got arrested. So it has to do with the, the, the internet has done this. And then one last point is, Twitter, you can tweet about the Iranian blogger, you know, as, 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 as much as you want to, but the most, the, the most uh, popular Twitter users are celebrities. You know, it's uh, Ashton Kushner, Britney Spears, I think, and Lady Gaga. Um, somebody tweeting about Iranian bloggers is way down on that list because it's, it, these, uh, there's also what's called trending topics. Same principle on the side of, it, of your of your Twitter you know, account. There is on the right hand side, again, a list of topics running down by cities. You can break it down by cities. You can break it down by countries. But once again, it's the same, it's the same kind of things. That it's not about Iranian bloggers. It is about you know, what celebrities are doing. Around mm -hmm. So I think it is hard. It's harder to, in a, in a situation where a small group of people are not controlling the, the way that we get information, and the information is becoming more decentralized. Um, while it has made it more democratic, in other words, it's made it possible for us to get more information, to specialize, etc. It is making it harder for the stuff to get to the front of the line. Um, you know, without overstating it. Yeah. yeah, you also mentioned about the Atlantic Monthly, uh, which is run by Andrew Sullivan, right? Mm -hmm. And is that correct that uh, Andrew Sullivan is the most favorite writer of uh, the President Obama? I mean, you should, uh, you should yeah. ask Obama about that. What I do know about Sullivan now is that And what is the secret of his success? The, the, I mean, this, this gets to sort of how, how one becomes, I suppose, how one becomes a successful blogger, like how it, um, what are, the, what are the, the recipe to operating in this kind of new media environment, whether you're an activist, whether you're a government. Um, and, and Sullivan, despite, you know, apart from being a journalist, he's openly, you know, he has, he has a, a politics that he puts out front, right? He was a conservative that now supports Obama's. Um, he is an obsession with Sarah Palin mm -hmm. um, on his side. 
he's actually the most popular, he's the most popular blogger um, um, at this point. And during the Iranian, um, the, 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 the protest in Iran, you know, he, uh, uh, the, the fact that a lot more people cared about that topic in America was ascribed to the fact that he was blogging about it, people would go to his site because he would take um, updates from Twitter um, people would email him stuff. He, by the way, does not allow for any comments on his on his blog. It's all one way, which is an interesting concept with how the internet is working. Um, but I think what makes him successful, and this says something about this new media environment, is firstly, it's about irreverence. So at once, he's very serious. He uh, he'll um, you know once a, uh, now and then he'll write a sort of long essay to state his opinion once a week, which is actually something he's written for somebody else, like that he gets paid to do. Um, but apart from that, he's an aggregator. He has one line about something and says, read it. And then he'll cut and paste um, an indent. You know, he'll indent like a paragraph or something from a news story or an article or something. If a reader sends him an email, he posts the email. So what he does by posting the email is he's creating a community. He's making his readers think that they are part of his site. They get exposed. He never says that. He never mentions their names. He's always say like, reader J or reader JF. He never actually says what their first and last names are. So he's created a community. Um, he's irreverent. Secondly, there's a very good piece if you're interested in the kind of culture that, that, that developed around new media. He has a piece called Why I Blog uh, that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly last year. Um, and there he talks about how the writing is, 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 is sort of on the fly. Um, it's, it's kind of writing while blood is rushing through your, you know, to your head. It's not like you can't rewrite it five times and give it to an editor and then send it out. You, when you write it, it goes out. It's also about engaging with your readers. So the readers might you know, say something, and then you'll change your mind. And you'll write tomorrow. You'll, write, you'll, you'll adjust your opinion about that particular subject. So what, what's made him successful is not to be, he's not rigid about it. Um, he's also, he, he also understands the way that the news, not so much the news cycle, but the way that the online news cycle works. That you gotta get stuff up, you know, Eastern Standard Time, between the hours of eight o'clock and five o'clock, that's when you, when you put up new stuff. After that, you're just merely debating, because it's when people are at work, when they're actually, this is an interesting phenomenon that researchers are pointing out when they're checking, when they're checking the internet. So to, to, to sum up, I think what makes uh, somebody like Sullivan successful or how do you become a sort of successful blogger, whether you're blogging about, in Sullivan's case, primarily about domestic politics mm -hmm. and really about sort of America's foreign wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, and then if you know, Iran and Ahmadinejad enters our conversation here, he'll blog about that. He's not necessarily blogging about um, things that maybe someone who's writing primarily about Turkey or who's writing about South Africa or who's writing about oil policy. I don't think so. I think we underestimate um, the ability of what we call old media to respond to the new conditions. I mean, I don't know much about the inner workings of the Wall Street Journal, but if you if you, I do read the Wall Street Journal online, and you have to pay to read the Wall Street yes. Journal. And actually, people are paying hmm. to read it. That's one thing. The second thing is, I think the Wall Street Journal um, has adapted well to, you know, the, anybody who's read it for a long time, right? It's a boring looking, it never used to have any photographs in it. Um, but in print, it's adapted, it has color photographs, it now has an art section, blah, 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 et cetera, and so on. Online, it's done the same thing. It has blogs, uh, it has videos, like a lot of video, um, video journals or video reporting. Um, it has also set up, you know, the TED, TED.org, you know, these the technology, mm -hmm. uh, entertainment and, and uh, design, mm -hmm. those annual uh, conferences. The Wall Street Journal has set up its own version of that. So it, I think that old, what we call old media has this, well, it's become more like a hybrid. They figured it out. Um, I'm not sure. The, the, the other thing is also, I thought, I, I, saw, I think I saw the other day, Salzberger of the Times said that he can see a point 
where the times won't be printed anymore as a printed paper and where people will just read it online on a, with a, or read it on a Kindle or read it on an iPad. So um, the decline of print, I don't think many of them, they don't, they don't see this as the end of, there is all the browbeating, oh, it's the end of newspapers. Um, while they're saying that, they've really adapted well to the new conditions. They're doing video journalism. They are, and again, I'm not, you know, journalists are used, losing their jobs. Uh, that's all happening, but I think they've also understood that it's a different environment, that yes, they, and this leads to your second question, there are other outlets out there that are not, that, that they, that old media initially, they were very suspicious of, if you go back, they still do, if you read, regularly sort of debates um, among journalists, Columbia Journalism Review, American, um, I forget the name of the journal of American, of American Journalism, uh, the American Journalism, I'll get to the name again, or even the Pew Research, you know, the people who bring up these regular surveys on uh, media usage or perceptions among journalists, there's a constant navel gazing and sort of, oh, you know, and who are these people and a questioning of the bona fides one of the of of the new crop of citizen journalists, but there's increasingly this this adapt, you know, not just in Turkey, but also here. There is this like, you know, we were uncomfortable or <coughs> we didn't want to report that, but the bloggers have now done it, so we have to do something about it. And in cases where, in countries, if you want, where where um, it may be politically uh, not uh, what is it a hot potato? You know, it's something that we don't we didn't want to touch. We can say the blogs, mm -hmm. and that in that way we can talk about. It. Oh yeah, I think that is definitely um, the case. I, I think that there is there is increasingly a um, uh, coming to terms by what is called. I, mean, I, I want to stop calling them old media. That because they've they've survived. I think it's nonsense that they have that they die that they're gonna die. I think they figured out the way this this game works. Um, they, if you go to whether it's Google, um, they like I mean there's lots of stuff happening. With with Google, for example, you can pay Google to get your stuff to the top. So you know so there's a story that came out last year that the Times in London hired an agency to uh, post its stories whenever they came out on aggregators. So they had somebody going on dig, I don't know if you know dig.com, it's an aggregator where people put stories. They had somebody set up a Facebook account, they, they had a bunch of people doing um, Twitter, telling people that their stories were coming out. So you know, they figured out this new media. I think, I think that that's something that people are underestimating about the old media, and they have deep pockets still. I mean, Fox, well, uh, Rupert Murdoch's was a big company, the over, the, 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 you know, the, the, the overarching company. They have pockets, they have deep pockets, they can, they can set it out, they can um, work with the technology and develop, you know, adjust to it to work to their advantage, yeah. Um, there's a lot of writing on this, uh, whether it was at the State Department, whether it was at the the White House, uh, whether it was other governments outside the U.S. So two things would happen. One is you would see uh, if, if the, the government is thinking about intervening in, in militarily or otherwise in one or other place, and having images displayed 24 hours on the news began to apparently have an effect on, on the response of a government because they would be like, well, we don't, maybe we don't have to. You know, in the time of a five o'clock bulletin and a ten o'clock bulletin with only half an hour's worth of news of which seven or eight minutes is like ad advertising, 